Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. 610 people have registered tonight, which is incredibly encouraging. Um, the talk is being videoed, so you can watch it again on the More Meadows YouTube channel, where you'll find other inspiring talks. Everything from Charlie Burrell from the Nep Estate on rewilding, to how to create a meadow field scale with Matt Pitts. We've got Professor Dave Goulson talking about saving our bumblebees, and there are many, many more. So we hope you'll check that out. The talk is, um, sorry, we're gonna have a Q&A at the end is what I wanted to say. Um, so please put any questions that you have into the, um, the right-hand panel there. If you can't see it, then come out of full screen and just ask any questions as you go. I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Adrian Thomas. Adrian, hello, Adrian. Hi, Donna. Thank Good you so you. much for joining us. Adrian's day job is working for the RSPB. It's a very wide ranging job, including setting up new nature reserves and creating visitor centers. Um, and outside of the day job, he is a very, very passionate wildlife gardener. And he's the face of the topic for the RSPB. And he's also the author and photographer for this award-winning book, The RSPB's Gardening for Wildlife. He writes articles for several national magazine and his own garden has featured on several TV programs such as Country File. He's also a trustee of the Wildlife Gardening Forum. So thank you for joining us tonight, Adrian, and over to you. Great pleasure. Thank you very much, Donna. And good evening, everybody. Um, it's uh, it's always weird to be looking out at nobody and yet knowing that many of you are out there. So thank you very much for, for tuning in. Uh, so uh, it's about an hour's talk. That'll be the aim before we go into uh, the question and answers. And uh, Steve, if you're happy to um, bring up the slides, we'll crack straight on. Um, uh, lovely to get to know more about more Meadows, which uh, has been fascinating to see all the work that's going on. So I know that I'm sat here amongst uh, fellow passionate uh, meadow makers and lovely too to be joined by members of the Wildlife Gardening Forum, which as Donna says, I'm a, a trustee of there. So uh, if you're a member of More Meadows, but don't know about Wildlife Garden Gardening Forum, then do check it out and likewise in reverse. It's amazing what both groups are doing. Right, uh, so the talk tonight is how to make and maintain mini meadows for wildlife, uh, which is a, a very straightforward and uh, objective title. Uh, sometimes when I give talks, I give them a, a rather more jazzy title. And I thought that for those of you who like a little bit more sparkle, you might like to think that you're in a talk called Magical Mini Meadows instead. So whichever works for you, that'll be our talk tonight. Uh, as Donna said, I work for the RSPB and the wildlife gardening is a great passion in, in my spare time. Uh, I also do wildlife sound recording and, and did the RSPB book about birdsong and the two seem to mesh really nicely. And then the, the third picture there, that's me and my day job, sometimes with hard, hard hat on out in the countryside. And I was really lucky as a child to be brought up with nature around me. Indeed, I have little log books that go right back to when I was first allowed to use a, a fountain pen or a by road, logging the wildlife that I saw uh, as a young boy. And yet the irony was my sister, who wasn't so much into wildlife, she submitted uh, an entry in a wildlife gardening competition back in sometime in the mid 1980s. And um, that's her middle of shot, me peering out from behind her, she won this prize, which really aghast me because uh, I was the one who was most interested in both gardening and in wildlife. So I, I set out to compete with my sister and this is just to show my, my gardening credibility to you all. I was the children's essay competition winner in the National Vegetable Society. It's my biggest claim to fame ever. I'm very proud of it. There I am in the senior section and what I don't know about cucumbers isn't worth knowing. But I thought I'd start the meadow section here with 
uh, well, let's start with this and a little bit of heaven. Uh, I am um, I'm very pleased to bring you some some bits of heaven and a little bit of hell as we go through this talk. But let's start with heaven. And this is a genuine wild uh, wildflower meadow that I photographed in the Alps. One of my favorite locations to go and visit. This is nature at its richest, creating meadows for everybody to enjoy. In fact, I'm going to give you a little suite of pictures here from some of the Alpine and Pyrenean meadows that, uh, that I visited, which just shows what nature can do uh, with a, a glorified lawn in effect. Uh, there's the kind of situation that you might find these meadows in, and I'm going to continue to show you bits of heaven here. This is the Dolomites in northern Italy with the meadows in the foreground. Uh, oh, and this is the uh, the Alps at Wengen, uh, looking towards, uh, I think that's Jungfrau and the Eiger would be to the left of that. Wonderful, wonderful meadows. And for me, to go there and feel the joy of being in those meadows has been one of my uh, uh, great inspirations when thinking about meadows. But we have some glorious meadows back here in the UK, and I know that many of you in Moor Meadows have created some of them your own. This is um, a meadow full of green-winged orchids uh, in Suffolk, uh, and this is into my home county of Worcestershire, a meadow called Eads Meadow, uh, which is absolutely lush and gorgeous. But as tonight's talk is very much about meadows within a garden context, within a home context, mini meadows and pop-up meadows. Um, I think one of the, the real inspirations from going to places like the Alps and the Pyrenees is to see how meadows run right up to the doors of the houses uh, and, and the cabins and, and the wooden um, uh, accommodation that they have there. It's seen as an accepted part of the landscape. Letting that grass grow long all the way up to and through the villages and towns is such a, a, a difference to our typical way that we approach meadows or have done in terms of the garden lawns in the UK. Uh, in fact, this photo coming up here is um, was I took in Zermatt in the Swiss Alps underneath the Matterhorn only last September. You can see a line prop in the background. I don't know if the homeowners know that they've got meadow clary in the garden here. I think they probably do because they've allowed it to come up and, and flower, but it's just in somebody's back garden and, and a total inspiration to, to see them. And here's a little bit of hell to contrast with what I've just shown you. This was the state of the garden when I bought my current property back in 2014. Uh, I think my ideal canvas for a garden is a completely empty field uh, and I got perhaps my second best option which is a totally overgrown and abandoned garden and the, the bareness of the uh, the ground that you see here is because a third of the garden was roved by about 40 chickens over the course of about 30 years. Uh, so this is what I inherited. And I think you can probably imagine this uh, is ripe for improvement. But I thought we'd start with a little potted history uh, of meadows. Uh, 1930s, left hand side, and that's probably uh, an ideal photo to sum up what meadows were like back then. Since then, uh, through to the 1980s, we've lost 97% of our lowland hay meadows, which equates to about 385 hectares lost every day, which uh, those of you who are in old money, that's probably around about a thousand acres lost every day over that entire 50 year period. Now, interestingly, that figure of 97% decline is the one that gets quoted. And indeed, I think it was the one that cropped up in the uh, the Grasslands episode of Wild Isles uh, on Sunday evenings with David Attenborough. Um, it is a figure that's taken from a paper that was uh, written in 1984. So the 97% the decline occurred until then. And yet you'll still see that fact quoted in all the press ever since then. So it does pose the question, what has happened to Meadows since the 1980s? We're almost um, 40 years on since that paper was written. And it's, it's somewhat more difficult to find exact stats of what has gone on since then. But the evidence is that during the rest of the 1980s and the 1990s, Meadows continued to decline. They can continue to be lost, uh, plowed up, fertilized, pesticides, 
uh, added. Um, in many cases, the grassland is still there, but it's lost almost all of its wildflower value. And in the 80s and the 90s, somewhere between 25 and 65% of meadows are thought to have been lost during those next two decades. And then figures have stabilized since then. So it looks like the figure is probably a minus 98% figure up to the current day from the 1930s. In terms of the remaining semi-natural grassland, again, it's, it's quite difficult to pin down the exact numbers, but these figures from 2008 are quoted uh, in the Biodiversity Action Plan uh, from that year. And it's uh, figures in hectares, so multiply it by about two and a half to get your acres figures. And you can see that uh, lowland dry acid grassland, kind of heathy grassland, by 2008, there are about 20,000 hectares left in England, 36,000 in Wales, 4,000 in Scotland, and a small amount in Northern Ireland. Then lowland calcareous grassland, what you tend to think of as limestone grassland and chalk grassland, almost 40,000 hectares in England, way, way down on what it used to be. But um, in comparison to the other types of, of lowland grassland uh, is, is the highest figure there. Uh, a little bit, just over 1,000 in Wales, almost 1,000 in Scotland. Uh, and then this interesting figure of lowland meadow, your proper lowland hay meadow, down to only just over 7,000 hectares in England, only just over 1,300 in Wales and just under 1,000 in Scotland, just under 1,000 in, in Northern Ireland. Tiny, tiny figures, just to give you a comparison, RSPB Nature Reserves all added up together is round about 140,000 hectares. So there you've got in front of you on the screen the uh, final existing resource of all of those types of, of lowland meadow left in the UK. And if there was a slide that is to illustrate why we should do something, what is the motivation for trying to do something to save meadows? There it is in, in one slide and the slide before the, the loss of meadows. Since the 1980s, there has been a, a wonderful amount of both research and champions of meadow restoration. I've put just some of them here on screen, but there are uh, many more and we'd include more meadows in that as well. Uh, on the left, we've got Christopher Lloyd with the meadow work that he did at Great Dixter down in Sussex. Uh, we've got Pam Lewis's book there on making wildflower meadows. Those of you who are lucky enough to go and see her garden at Sticky Wicket in Dorset before Pam uh, sadly had to um, stop looking after the garden uh, before she, she died. Uh, wonderful, wonderful garden. Chris Baines's book there, in fact, um, I, I have the, the first edition of uh, Chris's How to Make a Wildlife Garden here. This is a 1985 book, so just after the point where those stats had been created about the loss of meadows. Uh, and Chris's book stands the test of time now, uh, many editions later. Chapter six um, uh, on his book, called Living Lawns and Wildflower Meadows. And he really does go through uh, a lot of the, um, the, the science that lies behind creating meadows. So the science has been in place for a good 40 years now. In fact, um, I, I'd probably also quote here Miriam Rothschild and the work that she did uh, to champion the restoration of hay meadows. Interestingly, Chris's book from 1985, I, I've managed to find an older book about gardening with wildlife. This is the oldest one I've managed to find. If anybody has got anything earlier than gardening with wildlife from 1982 by the RSPB, I'd be really fascinated to know. Um, it does have uh, little sections of diagrams of how to make uh, wildlife friendly gardens. Those of you can still see my little picture on, on the screen there, little diagrams. I picked this one out because I thought it was really interesting. 1982, and it's inviting you to leave an area of your lawn to grow long and to grow around it giant hogweed and a safety barrier of ground elder. Well, advice has changed, hasn't it, since, uh, since 1982. On the right hand side, we've got Nomo May and the wonderful work that Plant Life has done to champion people around the country, encouraging them to uh, create mini meadows in their gardens. I think I'm going to quote our, our king as well here because the work that Prince Charles has done at Highgrove to champion uh, wildflower meadows, I think is fabulous. And of course, we've seen wildlife friendly gardening go from being incredibly niche back in the day of Chris Baines. Chris Baines did the first wildlife show garden at Chelsea. And when he got his award, famously, it came with 
uh, it had written on it that it was a wildfire garden because presumably they couldn't really believe that it was going to be a, a wildlife garden. Uh, to the present day where wildlife friendly gardening is promoted seemingly in every gardening magazine, on every garden TV show, the, the change in the last 10 years or so is really quite phenomenal to it becoming uh, a mainstream element. But that doesn't mean there's not still work to, to do to encourage the public to really embrace wildlife friendly gardening and obviously the subject of, of tonight, turning your lawn uh, or creating mini meadows in your back garden or even front gardens, of course. Now, just to say what we're not talking about here, and I know I'm amongst experts and many of you won't need to have this reiterated, but just in case we're not talking about this, let's take it on to the next slide. Poppies, uh, corn chamomile, corn marigolds, cornflowers, they're all what I term cornfield annuals. They're all annual flowers and they're not uh, what you'd see on the right hand side, a hay meadow. And the difference is so important. Uh, the work done at Sheffield University to develop loads of the annual mixes has been absolutely incredible. Uh, the pictorial meadows work, and that's probably the only downside to their work, the fact that they called it pictorial meadows, because the difference in management is so profound. Cornfield annuals on the left, annual plants that uh, germinate, grow, flower and die all within the one season and then the ground ideally needs to be recultivated, usually needs to be re-sown. It is a, an agricultural tillage method uh, of creation, whereas the hay meadow on the right is a perennial meadow where even the term meadow comes from the old English, I'll try and pronounce it midway, from the Germanic base and basically meadow means something that is mown. And to me, that is the critical uh, distinction between the two. Something that's dug on the left and re-sown with annual seed, something on the right, which is a perennial hay meadow that is managed by cutting, by scything um, or shearing. Um, and the number of people that I still encounter who are disappointed when they plant a wildflower meadow, a hay meadow, because they're expecting the, the fireworks show on the left, whereas what you get with a wildflower meadow, as I'm sure that um, many of you have experienced when you create, is something far more subtle. It is a beautiful tapestry, but it is uh, lower key, and for that I love it. Before I go on to show you some case studies of mino, mini meadows that I've been creating myself, uh, which forms the basis of the talk. I just wanted to touch on the inspiration for me. And we've seen some of my uh, heavenly shots from the Alps, but there were some meadows much closer to me. This was within walking distance of my home where I was, I was born and where I grew up. Uh, and it is a, a steep bank leading down to a fertilized meadow at the base. But because the, the meadow has never been able to be mown, it has a surprisingly rich uh, flora within it. It's not a nature reserve. Nobody was championing it or shouting about it within the village. Uh, and it took me a while to find out that actually this was a bank that had bee orchids in abundance uh, and dyes green weed and a wonderful array of wild flowers. But in my work with the RSPB, my volunteer side of things, my wildlife gardening, uh, Every edition of the RSPB's magazine, four times a year, I go get to go and visit a gardener who's doing amazing things for wildlife in their garden around the country. And in doing so, I've been able to visit uh, gardens such as Jenny Steele's uh, over in Shropshire, um, who I would regard as uh, the queen of meadows with all the creation that she's done. That, that is her meadow and her house in the background. Uh, this was a, a wonderful garden up in Cheshire that gets open for the Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Again, created from scratch with a lovely shepherd's hut in it, um, stuffed full of ringlet butterflies. Um, and this is uh, the garden of Richard Brown, who runs Emma's Gate, the wildflower seed provider. Uh, and he is not only uh, passionate about selling and cultivating uh, seeds for sale, but about managing his own meadows. Uh, growing them and then scything them in the traditional way. And it was wonderful to go and see Richard in action scything his, his meadow down. So all of these added with the Alps, added with my uh, local meadows to where I was born and brought up, um, have left me with uh, a, an abiding uh, 
uh, love four meadows. So I've got four case studies for you here of meadows that I've been doing in my back garden. And we're going to start with chicken pen meadow. And as we saw a little bit earlier, chicken meadow, chicken pen meadow started out as a rather denuded landscape down at ground layer, although it did have a canopy of suckering damson trees and fallen fruit trees within it and um, uh, a few nettles uh, and not much else in it. This for me was an interesting experiment to try because the uh, established notion is that in order to be able to create a wildflower meadow, you have to have impoverished soil. And I wanted to see what would happen when uh, I tried to create a meadow on something that had been a chicken pen for 30 years with 40 chickens in it. Was that even possible? What would I end up with? And because I see my garden as a little bit of an experiment pad, this was a chance to get it wrong. Uh, rather than necessarily get it right. What would happen? Was there anything of any value that I could create here? I rotivated the area, I cleared the damson suckers from it, left some of the, the, the finest fruit trees still standing. You can see the concrete posts that surrounded this third of an acre chicken pen in the background. I did to remove some of the fertility, take off the top four inches of topsoil, but didn't go lower than that. This wasn't a major removal of topsoil. And my feeling was that the chicken manuring would still uh, be allowing a lot of the richness of the, uh, the ground to persist. I prepared, prepared the, the, the ground well, uh, created a fine tilth, raked it out, uh, planted my seed mix, split it up into batches so that I could try and do uh, an even sowing rate. Um, I do like to make my own mixes. I often take a, a basic uh, Emma's Gate type mix, but then buy some other stuff from somewhere else and, and give it a whirl. My soil is clay. I'm at the foot of the downs, but I'm on this curious little strip of soil that is rich with flints, but uh, really quite a, a thick clay with a slightly acidic tone to it, which is really unusual down here in Sussex next to the chalk downs. Um, and th there's no seed mix that is formulated for my soil type. So it is a case of um, uh, suck it and see. Let's see what can work within it. Sow the seed at the recommended sowing rate, uh, about four grams per, per square meter. And I thought it's best to show you here that uh, whilst I'm incredibly lucky to have an acre of garden, I am in a suburban location. I have housing all around me. The yellow uh, rectangle describes the area of my garden and the area of chicken pen meadow is about 20 meters long by about 10 meters wide. Um, and I did say earlier that there's a critical difference between cornfield annuals and between a, a, a hay meadow mix. And yet this is what came up from my bed in the first year because within my mix, I'd included a nurse crop of cornfield annuals. Having tilled the soil, having created that tilth, it's a wonderful opportunity in year number one and then with a decreasing scale after that, to actually mix into your perennial meadow mix, uh, your cornfield annuals, your poppies, corn marigolds, corn cockles, corn flowers. Uh, poppies didn't do well at all. You can't see a single poppy there, but you can see all the rest of, of those typical cornfield uh, annuals that came up. And then as this nurse crop, they provide cover uh, for the more slowly emerging perennials beneath in the mix. So it's a wonderful thing for year one, but then anticipating that that colour blast that you get from it is going to decrease every year subsequent to that. Uh, here you've got the cornfield annuals still persisting in the foreground with a little bit of a, a poppy, but with the developing uh, chicken pen meadow in the background. And you can see it's a somewhat shady meadow. It, it is in effect a woodland glade meadow. But with all of that chicken fertility going on under the surface, fascinating to see what would survive within it. Um, and indeed it became quite a, a rich lush meadow, but with the addition of yellow rattle, 
the meadow maker, which I'm sure many of you have got in your meadows, its ability to suppress the vigor of the grasses has been incredible. You can see in the meadow there, I've included things such as red campion as it is a, a, a meadow glade type mix. And I'll explain a little bit more about the log pile in the background later. But I really have been um, pleasantly surprised at how well and how varied the, the number of plant species is within chicken pen meadow. And then of course, the critical thing is having established the meadow, what wildlife then comes to use it? This is it in, in summer with a, a mature um, apple tree in the foreground. And you can see that glade-like effect. It's a wonderful place for, for bats to circle uh, of a spring and summer evening over the, the top of the meadow. And because bird's foot trefoil has done so incredibly well in the meadow, it only took two seasons for this species to establish itself. On the right hand side, you've got the uh, dried chrysalis, the dried pupil case of it. And on the left, you've got the caterpillars, which um, are really incredibly showy. A little bit later in spring, come May time, I'll expect to see these caterpillars clambering up the bird's foot trefoil stems all through chicken pen meadow. And you may have guessed that they emerge into six spot burnet moths. Uh, and there is now a, a flourishing colony of the burnet moths in chicken pen meadow. Uh, and you get this kind of spectacle going on. This is them on common knapweed, uh, which is doing very well in the meadow indeed. And you get these mating pairs. Uh, and as soon as you get uh, females emerge, you get the male zooming in like the one on the right hand side to them. Um, I love the fact that both the caterpillars and the adults are such showy insects. And the, uh, the science has shown that the showiness is because they're so distasteful. And that um, distastefulness comes from their dart of bird's foot trefoil. They're actually able to synthesize from the bird's foot trefoil leaves as a caterpillar, they're able to synthesize um, uh, hydrogen cyanide uh, and it's thought that the females pump this out as a waft into over the top of your meadow and that's why the males home in so expertly on the females and it, it fascinates me to think that as I wander through and sit in and sometimes crawl through chicken pen meadow uh, I'm doing so through uh, this mass of hydrogen cyanide that's being kicked out. What also comes into the meadow, and I included in, in the mix this one of my favourite wildflowers, which is garlic mustard. Uh, some of you might know it's Jack by the Hedge. Food plant of the orange tip butterfly caterpillars. Um, but I was then delighted to find out that the little insect that you can see hovering above the flower there with its handlebar moustache as it, as it appears, uh, that's the meadow longhorn moth. Uh, one of that wonderful range of moths that have ridiculously long uh, antennae. Those of the meadow longhorn aren't quite as long as uh, something like um, uh, uh, some of the other species, but even so, they're a fabulous thing. And you get these little bouncing groups of the meadow longhorn over uh, the garlic mustard flowers. The reason being that their caterpillars too feed on the garlic mustard leaves. Uh, and then Chicken pen meadow has also been colonized by common blue butterflies. Uh, and the thrill of seeing a butterfly in the meadow is one thing, but the thrill of seeing a mating pair within the meadow and knowing that they feel that this is a place that is worth setting up home is, is so wonderful. Um, the only sad thing I find when seeing butterflies mating is the fact they don't get to look into each other's eyes. Uh, it must be quite distressing for them, but at least they've set up home here. Uh, to the extent that uh, those of you who've got the ability to lean in your, into your screen and follow the line of my, my finger, you may be able to see the little pale green dot in the middle of the Burstwood Trefil leaves there. And that is the egg of common blue within Chicken Pen Meadow. What I wasn't expecting to arrive in Chicken Pen Meadow was this, which is the small blue. Uh, it's a bird that is found down here on the the Sussex Downs, but the nearest colony to me, I reckon, is at least 1.5 kilometres away. And it just goes to show the incredible ability of wildlife to find new habitats when they're uh, created. 
And I always like to talk about wildlife friendly gardening, not in terms of the wildlife that you can attract, because that word attract seems to suggest that you do something and somehow it magically lures in things because of what you've done. For me, the essence of wildlife friendly gardening is creating the habitats in the knowledge that so much wildlife is so often on the move. It's on the hunt, it's heading out and it's looking for suitable habitat. Uh, and in seeking to illustrate this slide, uh, it is my toad. It wasn't really carrying a suitcase, but I like to think it was. I did go online and check out, uh, you know, when you Google things, and I thought I put wildlife on the move, see if I could get a, a better picture uh, than this one. This is what came up for wildlife on the move. I love the internet, amazing. Um, but wildlife friendly garden, for me, it's not about attracting things from afar. It's about giving those wildlife that pass through a reason to stay. And that for me is what creating mini meadows, pop-up meadows in gardens is all about. It's recognizing that lots of wildlife that likes meadows goes on the wander looking for it. Most of the time through most gardens, they pass through in an instant and you never see them. But if you've given them reason to stay and a reason to think this is going to be my home, that's when you get to see them. That's when you get all the benefit as they stop and colonize the space that you've created. It's a case of saying, welcome to paradise. You've arrived. You've arrived in the place that you really want to be. And I think the thing that caused the small blue to stay rather than pass on is that I had provided within chicken pen meadow. I'd planted, sown the seeds of uh, kidney vetch, which is the sole food plant of the small blue caterpillar. Now, I haven't yet managed to get a colony established, and I'm working hard to uh, get more um, kidney vetch in the garden, knowing that I, I've genuinely got the chance of small blues passing through, and I want more of them to stop as they go through. So chicken pen meadow, it's not a perfect hay meadow by any stretch of the imagination, but the wildlife that is colonizing it, I'm so pleased with it. And as an experiment, I didn't know whether it would work, but it has shown me not to turn your back on any bit of soil, no matter how enriched you think it is. Okay, case study number two is my mound meadow. And when I moved into the garden, there was a line of 32 Leylandii down one side of it, which were already somewhere between 60 and 70 foot tall. And when I moved in, 30 of them were standing and two of them had blown over and landed in the neighbor's gardens, just missing their conservatory. And when I went around to meet the, the neighbors, they were under no illusion that they wanted me to get rid of that line of Leylandii. And I didn't want the next 30 to come toppling down by like dominoes when it happened. Uh, so this is the situation for my mound meadow. It's about five metres by five metres in scale. So with, the, with each little case study, we're coming down in scale. And I had all of my Le Leylandii logs left to use. So I decided to try a bit of, and apologies to any German listeners, uh, German viewers or speakers, Hügelkultur, um, which is the, in essence, it is burying a lot of woody material and putting soil over the top and growing often vegetables over the top of that woody material. I thought I'd do an experiment here and find out if I could create a meadow mound over the top of my logs, knowing that I was going to have a lot of soil from when I created ponds in the garden. So here is some of the log pile disappearing under the, the soil that I'm excavating out of my ponds. And some of the soil also came from chicken pen meadow when I skimmed that top four inches off the top of, of the logs. Again, no guarantee of success whatsoever. So really fascinating to see how this went. This is the, the mound, I think in its um, uh, second year, uh, really doing well is wild carrot. Uh, you can see that showing up both in the foreground and then in, in the mid mid ground as well. Uh, red campion doing well within it. Some of the nurse crop of cornfield annuals that I put in, uh, there's some, uh, you'll see the yellow there of um, uh, corn marigold beginning to, to show uh, within it. And the, the mound meadow, it does a couple of things, I guess. One is that you get extra growing 
dimensions. It might be five meters by five meters on the ground, but because you've got the, the ups and then the downs, you actually get a greater volume of surface to put your meadow onto. And what you also get is sunbaked banks on the south side and shady banks on the opposite side. So in contrast to the flat meadow uh, in chicken pen meadow, or if you're converting a typical lawn, this is was interesting to me because of that micro habitats that you're creating when you, you create a mound. Uh, mound meadow has been really good for bird's foot trefoil as well, but because it's in the sunshine so much, I see way more in the way of pollinators, uh, such as this carder bee supping away at the, at the bird's foot trefoil. But what the mound meadow has really been good at is solitary bees. I find that little bare bits of soil as the mound, uh, the, as the logs disintegrate deep within it, the, the ground shifts around a little bit and little cracks open up in it. And solitary bees, um, such as, as this one, this is one of the Andrina mining bees. Um, uh, this has the, lovely that we've now got some English names for the solitary bees. I'm rubbish at remembering the scientific names. Uh, this one is, its English name is chocolate mining bee. Uh, and their ability to both use the cracks in the mound meadow, but also use the, the sunny, baked, south-facing uh, slopes of mound meadow have been uh, really impressive. And these have then uh, drawn in uh, these fellas and ladies. Uh, these are bees too, which is always quite fascinating with something that is mimicking a wasp so expertly. These are from the nomada genus of, um, of solitary bees. Uh, uh, and these are um, parasites uh, on the Andrina bees, each species of nomada bee typically parasiting what parasitizing one or two species. And this is the, the nomad bee that parasitizes the chocolate uh, mining bee. So all of this bee action is happening within the mound meadow. Uh, uh, and it is that sparseness of the turf, which in some ways mimics uh, downland uh, it seems to be the essence of the success of Mound Meadow. Okay, case study three, and I'm going to take you out of my garden uh, in Sussex and up to my mum's garden, still the same garden that I was brought up in, in rural Worcestershire. Uh, and this is her garden. It's a very uh, typical back garden in the village that she lives in. It's um, uh, highly intense agriculture uh, round and about beyond uh, the village uh, and the garden has looked like this ever since I've known it really with uh, a couple of lawns. Um, they would have been laid or sown by my dad. Unfortunately, um, my dad's passed on now and my mum can't remember whether this was from seed or from turf, but it would be, he, he was uh, a gardener in the good old Victorian sense. He'd have prepared the ground, either laid turf, I would expect sowed um, the, the lawn and would have been wanting a grassy lawn from it. So there was never any intent with this lawn for it to be uh, a mini meadow of any sort. Uh, but now that my, my mum is uh, losing her mobility, I encouraged her to have a little experiment out here. She likes her wildlife and uh, I use that as the excuse for her to turn her lawn into uh, a mini meadow. And what I encouraged was no management technique whatsoever. This is what you see promoted left, right and centre these days, which is just to leave your last uh, your grass to grow long. I marked out some squares for her because she, as you can see, she does like a little bit of formality there. The good old uh, 1950s, 1960s square and rectangular rose beds and flower beds and a square lawn and a straight path. Um, uh, but when my mum had to go into hospital last year, this is what happened when the lawn was just left for a few weeks. Suddenly the white clover was flowering in abundance. And I took this photo and once mum was back home, I was able to say, OK, if you just let the lawn uh, do its own thing, if you let it breathe, if you turn it into what Chris Baines would call a living meadow, then you've got the chance of seeing all the flowers and then all the bees and other pollinators that will come with it. Um, this is a little close up to show what was growing there in the lawn, Pre predominantly white clover coming up through the grass, but some lesser trefoil. There's a, a little bud of Germander speedwell that I can just see showing blue in the centre of the picture there. Um, so I marked out the areas for my mum. Uh, her gardener came and mowed the path so she could still get to the, to the benches. 
And my mum was fascinated to see things such as violets bloom. She had no idea that there were violets within the lawn. This was uh, the, the two pop-up meadows as they looked by high summer starting to, to flower. I did a little check of the range of grasses and there were at least seven grass species that were within the lawn, many of which such as Yorkshire fog that I would imagine have come in, wouldn't have been part of the original sowing or laying of, of the grass. And, and to see the, uh, the web of life, uh, well, that's corny, um, within the meadow, the, the tiny little spider's webs that showed up uh, in the morning dew within it. What my mum was most pleased about was to see that ladies' bed straw was within the lawn. Uh, Again, a plant that she had no idea was uh, being suffocated out by uh, the mower all the time, but was clinging on and just waiting for its chance to come up and flower. Now, the next slide, if I remember where I go to, right? Yes, this is actually within one of the meadows that I created. And this is uh, a moth uh, whose caterpillars specialise in feeding mainly on the bed straws and particularly likes uh, uh, ladies bed straw and this is the caterpillar of the hummingbird hawk moth uh, and my hope is that if mum continues her meadows that she will have these breeding in her lawn. Right final case study we're back to my garden in Sussex and this is what I call the square meadow and we're down to the smallest one of these uh, example meadows. It's just three meters by three meters. It's straight outside uh, my back window so I get to look out over the square meadow and as with all my little experiments I had a rationale behind this and the, what I wanted to do was see what would happen if I laid a bog standard turf lawn guaranteed to have no wildflowers within it. Is it possible from that starting point to create something that has the essence of a perennial wildflower hay meadow about it? Um, because the soil was um, particularly uh, damp, I did put a, a little layer of uh, coarse sand over the top and work that in just to give uh, the bog standard turf something uh, to sit on and allow it to survive. And here's the turf uh, after laying, looking uh, lush and even and uh, like a, a, a little bit of a snooker table. And you can see I've allowed the square meadow to start to grow up within the middle of it. Uh, I'm a great fan of the fact that wildflower gardening doesn't have to include untidiness. Uh, the closer it gets to being manicured or sterile, then the worse it is. But nature doesn't mind straight lines. Nature doesn't mind symmetry. And pop-up meadows, mini meadows, can be made to look really quite neat and tidy if that is your style of gardening and you don't want the neighbours to be um, tutting over the fence. So here's my attempt to, to do this with a bit of, of pure lawn. As the grass matured, it got to the point where you could still mow the straight lines uh, uh, around it. I think it still looked really nice, uh, but you could see that there is nothing except those grasses that I inherited with the turf. Typically, modern turf that you buy has got two, three, four heavily cultivated grass species within it, which often include meadow grasses and perennial ryegrass, and, and those are there within the meadow. Uh, I think it looks really attractive, but has um, some wildlife value because there is definitely a, a mini jungle effect there. There's, there's a density, there's a microclimates going on, there is a, an undisturbed nature within it. But could I now turn this into something even richer rather than just uh, a lawn full of cultivated lawn grasses that is allowed to grow long? Oh, there, there we have some of those meadow grasses and, and rye grasses within, within that lawn. So here, here's the technique in action that many of you will have seen within the textbooks. So mow really, really tightly so that um, you're, you're down to, to the barest length of grass within, uh, within the pop-up meadow. And then to uh, rake, scarify. Uh, this probably only took me, I would say for, the, for this three by three, nine square meters, took me about half an hour, I'd say, just to scrape with a with a plastic rake, uh, get out some of the, the thatch and open up some of the little pockets so that I could then seed a meadow mix 
into it. I did my typical homemade meadow mix. I kept this one uh, really quite uh, simple with some bird's foot trefoil and some cow slips uh, and some of the bed straws within it. Um, so not, not a, a particularly varied mix whatsoever. So that at the recommended seeding rate, again, about four grams per, per square meter. Uh, and this was it by its first year with clearly greater diversity going on within it. Now, the, the key plant, which is beginning to come up to the left of the bird bath there and flower is yellow rattle once again, Rhinanthus major, um, the, the meadow maker plant. Uh, but you can also see daisies uh, and buttercups starting to come up within the mix. There's actually a teasel in the foreground, which certainly wasn't part of my, my mix. Uh, in fact, you can see the teasels even better there. And you can see the buttercups beginning to, to flower and stand above the grasses, which in this iteration of the square meadow with the yellow rattle beginning to drain uh, the, the, um, the vigour of the grasses is, is uh, somewhat of a, a less lush meadow, allowing those meadow flowers their chance to thrive and, and survive. Another little view of, of the meadow there within its season. Uh, and a close-up with, um, uh, there is uh, annual vetch coming up through the mix there. That wasn't part of the seed mix that I created. Um, and things such as cats here have come into the meadow. Again, wasn't part of the mix that I sowed. So um, seed is arriving of its own accord into this uh, less lush, uh, less vigorous uh, mini meadow. It is the place of choice now in the garden that I get to see for jays to come and hide the oak acorns. So come autumn, there's something about this meadow and the, the, the openness of the sward that allows the jays to come in and poke their acorns into the turf and allow me straight through the kitchen window to allow to, to see the behaviour. And I love the fact that once they've buried their acorn, they then go and grab a leaf and place it very carefully over the position of the acorn, whether they expect that leaf to be there to guide them to it when they come back or whether it's a little bit of camouflage, uh, the jury is out on that one. But um, it's it's one of those fabulous bits of bird behaviour that you can see outside the window in the square meadow. But it's also the place with the bird's foot trefoil um, flowering. Uh, straight outside my uh, window on the patio is another of my experimental areas where it's can you create wildlife garden in pots and I have my bee hotels there and it's here in the square meadow that I get to see uh, most of uh, some of the solitary bee behavior such as this uh, leaf cutter bee uh, nectaring on the bird's foot trefoil. They'll then go over onto some of my other plants in order to cut out uh, the leaf discs to take uh, to, the, to the nest but I just love watching these leaf cutter bees in action. Um, they typically have underneath uh, the rear of the body, they have a brush, a pollen brush. They don't collect the pollen on their legs, but they collect them on that orangey brush under underneath the body. And yet curiously, when they're feeding, they will quite often do this bottoms up technique. Uh, and my suspicion is this is because they're nectaring rather than wanting to collect pollen at this point. So they don't want the uh, the brush picking up Birds filled trefoil pollen, they'll go and get that from some more open composites, composite type flowers later on. Okay, to take us through to conclusion, I thought, first of all, I just have a look at some of my favorite flowers that can uh, be cultivated within garden mini meadows. On screen at the moment, uh, you'll recognize yellow rattle, such a, a vital plant for the job it does underground, tapping into the grassroots, but such a winner above ground too. Those yellow flowers are loved by, particularly by carder bees, but also other species of bumblebee. Uh, and then the seed pods are, are really attractive when they go over. And it's so easy to collect the seed from it and distribute it somewhere else uh, in maybe a, part, a new part of the lawn or a bit of the meadow that hasn't got a particularly rich uh, bit of yellow rattle growing in it so you can help decrease the vigour of other bits of the lawn. Um, you might expect me to start in favourite flowers with the orchids and there's no denying that they are just exquisite on the left pyramidal orchid and amazing these days how many people have got pyramidal orchids growing in their pop-up meadows uh, and equally bee orchid on the right hand side. I have neither growing in my meadows yet but um, 
Orchids are notorious for how long it takes them to grow from their dust-like seed. Uh, but always the chance, always the chance that in time that they will come. Much easier to get the buttercups. And both of these photos were taken in the square meadow. Uh, and on the left, you've got the bulbous buttercup uh, with the sepals underneath the, the yellow petals uh, uh, down flexed so the, the sepals kind of point back towards the stem whereas on the right you've got meadow buttercup where the, the sepals um, clutch the flower so they're, they're not bent backwards. One of the easiest ways to tell the difference between the two flowers but uh, the buttercups really bring this flush of um, beautiful yellow um, come early summer. I love the cowslips. Uh, best to germinate, germinate by leaving the seed out over winter. They need that period of winter cold to really get them going. And what I do is I actually sow the seed direct into the meadows once the meadows are established. Just get out and push the seeds one by one around the meadow and let winter do its, its task. And this is the result. This is all from hand sown but individually sown seeds. And this again is a photo from uh, Square Meadow. There's a lot of yellow that can go on in meadows, but I love a little blue and purple as, as well. And um, bugle, I think, is a fabulous plant to get going within a meadow, particularly in a shadier or slightly damper area. Uh, and two plants here that are easy to get flowering, if not in their first season, then in their second, and then produce uh, a wonderful show within the meadow, particularly because they're taller plants. On the left, we've got meadow crane spill, um, so glorious as a, a native plant. On the, on the right, uh, betony. Both of them brilliant for pollinating insects and both of them just a, a, a joy to have within the meadow. And I put um, this one in, the knapweeds. I am a huge fan of greater knapweed. This is common or black knapweed, which is almost as beautiful, doesn't have the, usually doesn't have the, the ray of florets around the outside, just has the central pink pom-pom. But the, the knapweeds uh, are surely some of the best flowers within the meadow for nectaring butterflies. Here we've got a, a little bit of a tatty meadow brown with a six-spot burn it, homing in, probably going to displace the, the meadow brown from the flower, but everything from marbled whites to common blues to uh, the whites to gatekeepers will nectar very happily on the knapweeds within the meadow. Um, and whilst harking back to that slide of cornfield annuals, whilst uh, a hay meadow may not be that colour burst uh, fireworks explosion, I love that more delicate um, tapestry that goes on within uh, a pop up perennial meadow. If you do want a bit of glamour, uh, and I have done this, and I, I promised in this talk I'd mention a little bit about bulbs within the meadow. Here's a glorious native to go in its snake's head fritillary. There are some wonderful native meadows out there that are full of wild daffodils. So if they can do that in the wild, I see no reason why a meadow shouldn't have that. And I, I'm not averse whatsoever to uh, some tulip planting. They'll normally be very short lived within it, maybe some camassias. Um, some non-natives within a, a garden environment meadow are not to be sniffed at at all. And so much of the research that has been done in only the last 10 to 15 years shows how there is a lot of value to be had within a wildlife friendly garden from native plants and how some from non-native plants, sorry, and how some native plants actually have very limited wildlife value. So there is no golden rule of, of native must um, non-native must not. It's a much more delicate balance than that. And in a changing climate, I think we're going to have to ever more embrace some non-natives within the garden environment and accept that if it wasn't for uh, mankind doing climate change, if this was natural climate change, nature would have time to move uh, and plants would, would migrate effectively. I said I hadn't had the pyramidal or bee orchids in my meadows, but in chicken pen meadow, which is now six years old. Last year, my first florets of common spotted orchid came up, sown way back in 2015-16, and it's taken that long for the seed to get to the stage where it can produce uh, a noticeable um, leaf floret. And last year, I did indeed get two flowers off it. The, my joy was unbounded. I don't do it entirely for orchids, but um, what a thrill to get orchids in the meadow. 
I thought I'd add in a, a short section about mini meadow problem solvers. And in doing the experimentation, I certainly have encountered some of the problems that um, you can face out there. And the first one is flopped or flattened grass. This is the square meadow in its first year. And I showed a previous photo with all of that bog standard grass flowering stood perfectly upright. And then I woke up one morning to find it looking like this. All of that lushness flattened by this. Uh, and uh, this has uh, recurred in any of my meadow areas which have grown to be exceedingly lush. The foxes have adored rolling in it. I think it must be uh, a, a bit to do with bathing and a, a, a bit in some of the other meadows. Maybe some of the smells that come off the meadow uh, plants is good enough. But it kind of shows how a getting to a point where the yellow rattle has decreased the vigor is an important element of it. Or if you have a lush meadow because you have a really rich soil is actually not letting it get to a really uh, a tall stage where either foxes or weather, winds and rain can batter those grasses and in doing so smother the ground and in effect create this, this thatch over the top of it. If I have lush, lush meadows now, I actually go out and graze them. Um, not with my teeth, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I find it really therapeutic to sit, sit next to a meadow and just tug as a, a cattle would do and, and tug at any of the the lush bits that are there and graze the meadow down. Um, it's easy to do. I don't get tired doing it because I'm, I'm sat on my rear end doing it and um, you get to be close up with the meadow. Um, so I would recommend with any meadow area that grows really lush, don't just leave it uh, to the point where it flops, but take away some of the grass and in doing so, take that onto the comp compost and reduce the vigor. And year by year, that vigor will decrease. And with the help of yellow rattle, should get you down to a, a manageable meadow that the foxes don't get to rain bathe in. There is that question that comes from folk that when you do get to the point of mowing the meadow, um, how unsightly the brownness is. Um, to me, this is part and parcel of the annual cycle of the meadow. This is how hay meadows would have been in the past. And there is exactly the same shot two months later and nature's done its best. I haven't watered it. It wasn't a particularly wet summer, but grass is fantastic about um, uh, restoring itself after a dry period. Um, so I encourage people just to enjoy the process. Uh, a dry yellow cut meadow would have been what uh, all of our fair forebears would have experienced in the past. And then nature does its best at restoring. I've got this slide in because um, it's an intriguing one. Um, I love the fact that there's so much public attention on uh, creating mini meadows these days, but there is still a place for short grass. And if every lawn in the country became long grass, it would remove the feeding habitat, particularly of things like starlings, blackbirds and song thrushes, which need the short turf in order to move across it. And it's fascinating to see how few birds enter the mini meadows once they're long and how many of them continue to use the mown paths within it uh, and diversity is so so crucial and my final point of uh, coping with problems is how to safeguard wildlife when mowing uh, and for me um, uh, the, the critical thing is I actually, instead of using a mower out there, I use shears, which even on a 20 meter by 10 meter meadow uh, in my chicken pen meadow, I achieve in three or four uh, simple half hour sessions. And in doing so, I get really close up to everything. I can leave the hay lying uh, to, to brown off and drop its seed in the grass. I get to see if I'm getting close to uh, any slow worms or grass snakes or vole nests or anything in the grass. Uh, and I think doing it in stages and doing it as sympathetically as possible is, is really important. I've got you a seven point meadow, mini meadow summary. Number one, there are many ways to make a, a mini meadow. So don't feel that you need a, a, a textbook version. Accept that not everything will work and that some flowers may take years to emerge. Recognize that it will evolve. And some of those plants that grow in the first year may not survive in years two and three, but something may come later and the whole composition will, will change over time. It's not possible to create uh, a hay meadow in one go. The hay meadows of the past didn't evolve overnight, so why should your pop-up meadow let it evolve? Number five, really importantly, there's no right or wrong. Do what you want to. And then six, enjoy it. And seven, if you're doing it, 
and you share it, then there's every chance that other people will see it, enjoy it, and be inspired to do the same. So there's my seven points to a successful mini meadow. And as you can see, there's absolutely no blueprint whatsoever. I'll just flag um, the Wildlife Gardening Forum. Hi to all the members who are out there now. Those who don't know of the forum, it's free to join. There's a wonderful website. There is a how to create and manage a wildflower meadow out there. It is the only charity in the UK dedicated to Wildlife Gardening Forum. Uh, we have almost no income whatsoever, so it's all run by, by volunteers. And our mission is to bring solid science to wildlife gardening um, uh, across the country so that we're encouraging people to use best practice based on the research that's happened. Just to flag nature on your doorstep from the RSPB on the right hand side, which is all of our pages about things that you can do in your garden from mini meadows through to every other activity that you can think of. And I could equally have gone to wildlife uh, Wildlife Trust or the Royal Horticultural Society, who work with us so closely on the Wildlife Gardening Forum and in the RSPB, all the wonderful stuff that's happening out there. And as I say, Wildlife Gardening Forum members, if you don't know about more meadows, get in there and check out their website. It's so fascinating. Have a look at the map where people have marked all of their meadows and have a look at the case studies out there. And with that, I think there's only one way that I can finish, and this is to take you back to heaven with a, an abiding message to take away with you. Uh, it is go make hay meadows. Oh, my slide slipped a bit, but you can read it. Go make hay meadows while the sun shines uh, and we can all have a little bit of Julie Andrews in us while we do. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Adrian. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous talk. It was incredibly engaging. Um, and I just love your experiment with the three by three meter um, meadow, your last meadow, where you lay down um, a turf lawn and experimented. Fantastic. We've had Anything's lots of possible. questions. Hmm? Anything's possible, isn't it? it? It is. I thought it was a brilliant experiment because presumably that's a lot of people's lawns, especially if they've moved somewhere, they've got a new house and that's what's been laid. Um, we've had lots of questions coming in. Um, so first one for you is uh, Lynn Cheatham has a garden meadow. She's got a garden meadow on clay. Um, what seed mix would you recommend? I think that was your first um, meadow that you showed us, your chicken pen. Yes, pens. chicken pen meadow. It's, it's on a curious clay soil. I just took a standard meadow mix and added in plants that I either like or I felt might do well on the clay. Sometimes it's really difficult, even if you know what your, your soil type is. Yes, if you've got a good chalky soil, then you know you need to go for chalk soil. Um, in this case, I would go to one of the seed suppliers and you will find a clay mix within most of the good suppliers out there. And there are three, three or four really good suppliers who will give you a mix of a basic, uh, a clay mix, uh, a shade mix, uh, a chalky mix, a sandy mix. And I'd, I'd pick out that clay mix. But when you look at the, the seed mix within it, you'll find that there's lots of consistent features within all of them. You'll find that the napweeds are in all of them. You'll find that bird's foot trefoil will tend to be in all of them. Within my um, chicken pen meadow, I put bird's foot trefoil, but also greater bird's foot trefoil, which in uh, much prefers damper conditions. And that was which which of these is is going to do best within the meadow in ten years time? Maybe on current evidence, bird's foot trefoil will be predominating over greater, but both are surviving now and both are, are providing the food plants for so many moth and um, and the common blues and my burnet moths. And um, so, yes, on a clay soil, if you know what soil you've got, then definitely pick out those clay mixes, but don't be afraid to mix in something else because you never know in a garden if you've got little pockets of other soils in there or if something will survive. That's great. Okay, Kent Wildish um, asks, if you would recommend using yellow rattle in the autumn as a way to promote wildflower meadows in the first year or later. Um, and the second part of that, and what is the best time to mow cut? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm suspecting that you may be uh, aware, so thanks for the question, that yellow rattle needs that period of winter cold in order to germinate. So definitely a seed to scatter over a meadow after, or over an area of lawn after scarifying it in autumn. The seed lies there. We're now in early April and uh, yellow rattle down here in Sussex 
has germinated over the last three weeks. So it started to germinate quite early, but it's needed the winter cold, which down here I barely get a frost, but it just needs that down somewhere near zero in order for it to, to germinate uh, in the spring. So the second part of the question. When is the best time to ah, mow cut? Cutting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think one of the one of the reasons why gardens have come up the scale in terms of their value for wildlife is because in the past people dismissed them as as containing only common and garden wildlife and then the research started to happen with amazing people like Jennifer Owen who studied her Leicester garden for 30 years found it was stuffed with all sorts of creatures attention went on to gardens and we suddenly found that it's full of all sorts of interesting creatures uh, she found 2674 species I think in her garden over 30 years one of the reasons why gardens are so good for wildlife, the reason for that little preamble is because of the diversity within it, the diversity of habitats. You get a lawn here, a pond here, a shrub here, a different plant here. And I, my recommendation is don't stick to any great formula with when you should cut or when you shouldn't cut. Some books will tell you by July, some will be by September. Choose what works for you and you'll probably be cutting to a different regime than your neighbour. And in doing so, we create this mosaic of patchwork. If you have a really lush lawn, then I would say cut earlier to reduce that vigour and, and stop it collapsing in on itself and allow space for the wildflowers to really boom. But choose what works for you. There are some people for whom the kids are going to be home by mid-July and you need your football pitch back, so you cut it early July. Whatever works for you and in doing so, create that diversity. And um, If you've got the space, then do different bits within your meadows. I leave one part of chicken pen meadow uncut each season so by the next year, it's left a, a, a denser thicket, but then I move that to another place the next season. Diversity is everything. Brilliant. And just to confirm, once you've actually done the cut, yep. um, are you then continuing to mow it once it started to regrow back? You'll continue to mow it with the rest of the mown area. So I, I leave the, the cuttings where they lie on dry days for maybe three, four, five days to allow any of the seed to, to dry and be cast from the seed pods. Collect that all up. I actually create a hay stook rather than try and compost it. Why not? They do that in Romania in traditional hay meadows. So I, I create another habitat and uh, my uh, short-tailed field voles seem to love my, my hay stooks. And then I, I, in my meadows, will typically start cutting August time but spread it so I'm still cutting in September and then the regrowth I may cut it a couple of times through to November uh, just to bring it back back down again and then I don't cut in the spring because I've got my cowslips and uh, snakes head fertilities growing in it but you could do a cut in early spring that's another way of doing it all sorts of different ways this thing about there is no absolute right or wrong holds so true great thank you Adrian um Titania asks, how do you know when to manage and when to leave alone? She says she's now, all, well, you've, I think you've already answered this. She's now always paranoid that she will destroy lots of mini bees when she does anything in the garden. Yes. But that, you have answered that. There is inevitably with a effectively a, a mowing system, whether you consider that it mirrors an agricultural system or whether you consider that it mirrors wild animals grazing, something, some larva, some caterpillar, some egg will be lost in that process. And what you're relying on, I mean, it, it pains you, doesn't it, to, to think that that's the case. But whenever you garden, you're destroying something. But if your overall aim is to increase diversity and increase the populations of everything, that, that's the feeling that you have to go with and try and manage that meadow in a way that limits that damage. There is a popular TV host, gardening host, who advocates cutting your meadow as close to the ground after it's established. That is definitely not good practice. You're taking away so much so much potential uh, larvae, eggs, creatures within it. Um, so never take that meadow down to the layer that you would with a lawn after you've done that meadow creation, a close cut and scarifying. That's the last time that you scalp the lawn. After that, you're taking it at a really high level. And with the shears, as, as I say, I love it. I've been amazed how, how easy it is to do a 20 by 10 meter with shears over a few sessions. And as you go in, uh, it comes out a little bit higgledy piggledy, but you know that you're allowing creatures to escape from it and you're seeing any issues as you arise. You leave the hay in place. That allows more creatures to go back deep into it. And so many things like 
butterfly and moth caterpillars have evolved that where they feel the ground being moved, they feel hooves or they hear the crunching of, of, uh, of, of the mowing, your shears, they drop into the turf. Um, they just fall from whatever grass blade they're feeding on because they don't want to be eaten by cows or deer or or ox or whatever was grazing in the past. That's their defense me mechanism to get right down to base level. Great. Katie Smith asks, if you always recommend checking soil pH and composition before starting, i.e. picking your seed mix? Um, if you can, yes. I find that some of the seed... Um, Here's, here's me with me, me experience as well. Some of the seed pH kits give me really inconsistent results. So um, if you can, it's best practice to do so. Then you can pick your right seed mix. But I would always say that even if you've done the pH, picked your mix, why not chuck something in that isn't doesn't quite fit the specification on your pH tin and see how well that does, because it may surprise you. And the stuff growing in my slightly acidic um, chicken pen meadow, for example, that shouldn't be growing there, but seems to be doing absolutely fine within it. And I think that within a garden environment, knowing the history of what's happened there is so difficult. Who knows what happened in my urban ground before uh, I got there? So I anticipate there are pockets of different pH in different places. So great starting point. Absolutely agree. But don't feel that you can't then do a bit of experimentation after that. Okay, next one. Someone asks, is it possible to make a meadow where mass dandelions already dominate? <laughs> um, uh, so I would say yes. I would say that the likelihood that dandelions will continue to dominate will be pretty high. Um, but uh, I've just done uh, my latest article for uh, one of the magazines. Uh, and I've put in my top 10 plants in there, of which dandelion is in my top 10. And in part, it's to be provocative uh, because it seems to be such a, um, uh, in so many gardeners' minds, a maligned plant. And yet it's such a fantastic plant for pollinating insects early in the season, one of the best ones for early emerging solitary bees. Uh, it's one of those generalist moth caterpillar leaf types, just as your tortoise will eat it and your rabbit will eat it, so will so many different types of moth caterpillar. And the unripe seeds are a brilliant source for goldfinches uh, well in advance of the first teasels coming on. So I would say um, do what you do in creating uh, another meadow. Meadow seed mixes aren't particularly expensive. It's not, you know, you can buy um, a packet that will cover really quite a large area for the price of a single pot plant and just give it a whirl and, and see what you can create with a bit of scarification, with a bit of hand weeding. I do hand weed in, into the meadows. If you have to weed a flower, flower border, then inevitably you have to do a bit of weeding in meadows. I take out teasel, I take out uh, most of the ragwort that goes in just so it doesn't take over. It's probably only an hour's work over the course of a whole year to do that spot weeding. I see myself as a particularly picky cow that likes teasels and uh, ragwort when I, I go in there. I see myself as a herbivore that goes in and uh, and takes what I want for my, for my salad. And um, uh, that's what I recommend that you do with your, your dandelion crop. But enjoy the dandelions and see what else you can get in amongst it. Great. Um, Titania asks, is it possible to create a glade meadow for dry semi-shade? Yes, absolutely. Chicken pen meadow is that. It has some sunny spots in it, but there's no spot that gets the sun all the way through. That clay dries out incredibly. You might, you might with your dry shade, have uh, sandier soil. Um, it, it is that case of going to a seed merchant, uh, a good wildflower seed merchant, and you will find shade mixes in there, which have some of the grasses that are more suited to a shady environment. And then things such as the red campion and uh, the garlic mustard that you saw in the slides, which are likely to create quite a different effect, almost like a, a under hedgerow type effect around the, the shadier parts of that, that meadow. So it will look and feel quite different than one that basks in sunshine, but will then create the conditions that creatures of of dry shade enjoy. It will probably still have a bit of sparseness in it. When you read the books, it says that yellow rattle doesn't do so well in shade. It does absolutely fine in my, my shady areas. So it is a give it a go again with this thing that 
um, a seed mix. Um, when I go to a garden center and see how much plants are individually these days and look what, what you can get, how many plants you can get and what area you can cover with a meadow seed mix, uh, it's, uh, it's surely one of the best things to try. Uh, you're not gonna lose much and you're gonna gain loads. Okay. Jill Gardner asks um, if you ever include grasses in your seed mixes. Yes, I do. And all of the meadows that you've seen, um, uh, obviously my mum's meadow didn't put anything on there. That was the experiment to see what was in there. Square meadow didn't put grasses uh, because I just put that minimal seed mix in, in there. But of the examples that you've seen and other meadows that I've done, I always go with the grass mix in there because what you want is a hay meadow with flowers within it. Those grasses are so essential for so many uh, of, in particular, our meadow butterfly species, grasshoppers, uh, the voles that are going to live there. They're all going to be feeding on the grasses. That is the staple salad item of choice for so many species. Your meadow browns, gatekeepers, uh, marbled whites, your skipper species, your speckled woods. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get wool, they'll all be feeding on the grasses. And when you get a proper um, wildflower meadow mix, you'll be getting wild grasses within it. The old staple within the hay meadows of the past was a lovely little grass called, um, oh, I'm going to forget the crested, crested dog's tail. Let yeah. me know if I got that wrong. Um, me and names. Uh, um, yeah, that's Thank you. Uh, and you get sweet vernal grass in there, stuff that you'd never get in a normal lawn. Um, you typically won't get things such as Yorkshire fog, which can grow very densely. Uh, and you'll get, um, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get that native grass mix that you just won't get in a roll of turf from B&Q. Um, typical mix will be 80 grass, 80%, 20% wildflowers. And that's enough to give you the diversity within the meadow. Okay, next one. Lots of questions. Very good questions. Richard Turkington says that he planted uh, an annual and perennial mix a couple of years ago in his front garden and yarrow seems to be taking over sections of it. He likes yarrow but wants to keep it in balance. Any yeah. suggestions? Uh, this is where I would get down on my hands and knees, on my kneeling pad, now I've got to my age, uh, and I'd, I'd weed out. I'd hand pick out uh, the yarrow, opening up little little gaps, uh, sprinkle a, a little bit of mixed seed. And on that, I would probably put uh, little bits of the seed that I really wanted. I'd probably buy the individual seed packets to try and give me uh, what I wanted. Uh, and it is, I found it amazing what can be achieved in half an hour. And while you're doing it, you see things that you've never seen before. You find plants. Um, I remember sat weeding my square meadow and I realized that some eyebright had come up in, in the mix. I never sowed eyebright. It's another of those semi-parasitic uh, species, not, not as showy as yellow rattle, but does more to suppress the, the grass growth. I don't think I'd have, I'd have seen it unless I was down there picking through, getting bits of teasel, getting bits of ragwort out of there. And I would do that with, with the yarrow and not expect nature in the early days to give you exactly what you want. I think that the uh, the human hand can still play a part because this is your garden and this is this is your playground. Sheena McCauley says she hasn't mowed her meadow from last year. Um, should she should she cut it now, basically mow or scythe it before the new flowers appear? And I would to cut grass. Yeah. As, as I say, there's no absolutes here. If you leave it to uh, tall this year, the likelihood is uh, that. Um, the diversity will begin to get lost. It's beginning to head towards rank grassland if it's left. If you like it now, as I say, there's no absolute rules whatsoever. If it was my meadow and I, I just hadn't had a chance to cut it, I would take it down now because it'll allow the fresh growth to come up. It'll allow the smaller flowers the chance to see the light and see the sun and, and flower. And you'll probably maintain your diversity better for it. Remove the cuttings. They can go onto the compost uh, and see where it goes. And it's definitely not too late to do that now. Um, and Christine Jackson has a question about yellow rattle. If she introduces it to um, her grass and the village green, would it spread rapidly to neighbouring pasture land where it might not be welcomed? Uh, OK, uh, <laughs> so the likelihood is that really rich um, pasture land is fertilised. And that creates such lush, lush growth in the grass. That is exactly why we've lost so many meadows. They were ploughed. They were fertilized and they had herbicides put on. Those were the three real reasons why we lost so, so many of 
the, the meadows and the act of fertilization to create the lush sward, the grass just outcompetes, including the, the yellow rattle. So um, yellow rattle has quite a heavy seed. If you put it in a, a garden environment, it'll take quite a long time for it to get knocked and brushed and um, the foxes to uh, flick the, the seed heads. But it's not so much a windborne seed that's being picked up and moved long distances. It would struggle really to make it across hedgerows. Before going and doing it in a public space, make sure that the, uh, the owner of that space knows and is in agreement with what you're going to do there. But uh, I think the risk is fairly low, both of it arriving in, in the pasture land uh, in the first place, but secondly, of it persisting if that pasture land is being maintained in any kind of an intensive way. That's exactly what technology uh, allowed uh, the decimation of our, our meadows uh, to occur through. Both Alison and Laura ask, how can you combat mare's tail weed? Would yellow oh, rattle help? It doesn't. Uh, yellow rattle doesn't tap itself into, into mare's tail. Uh, it's one of those curious garden weeds. You don't see it in huge abundance out in the countryside. And yet there's something within the garden environment that seems to suit things such as mare's tail, ground elder, uh, bindweed. You'd, you'd think from how well bindweed, greater bindweed, does in the garden, that it should be smothering the, the landscape, and yet it doesn't. And there's something about that turning of garden soil and the richness of garden soil that seems to suit them. With mare's tail, it's another one where I genuinely would get down on my hands and knee, knees, except that it's probably going to be there for a long time, but reduce its vigour as much as you can with a bit of hand weeding and let the other plants come up uh, around and through it. It has a beauty, of its own and that's one of the intriguing things with weeds is is learning to love them a little bit um but unfortunately the yellow rattle isn't going to to help on on that front it is yeah hand of man doing a little bit of um uh, weeding and editing okay a few just a few more scully bold would like to try to collect local um, seed and they've seen some cuckoo flower growing in a field nearby. How and when could they collect seed from it? So uh, first of all, just ensure that you're not on a, a triple SI um, or a, a protected space where collecting seed may be um, not permitted. Um, collecting seed is a, a curious a thing and I love to do it. And there's a, um, a, a huge number of plants I have growing in the garden that I've collected as seed from the wild and the seed collecting season, um, I think in my naivety 20 years ago, I'd have thought it was autumn when you do that. But so many flowers are setting seed pretty soon after they have flowered. Um, and so the seed collecting season really runs from, well, it, it's, it's starting now with coltsfoot seed, uh, with uh, your cuckoo flower, it's, it's quite difficult seed. I have had a real struggle to germinate it from seed, but I think anything is, is worth a try. Some stuff seems to be really easy. Yellow rattle is, is an absolute cinch. Um, so you'll need to be with cuckoo flower, um, high summer, late summer. Don't leave it until the autumn. You'll, you'll struggle to find the seed with it. Uh, and I think with um, cuckoo flower, ladies smock, I would do that into a seed tray, leave it out over winter, uh, it's another of those that is going to benefit from being out over, over winter, put it in a place where it's not going to be dug up or churned up, but where you can label it and see it rather than dropping it into a meadow situation. But it's, it's a great question that leads on to try it with, with all sorts of stuff. And the more local you can get uh, your seed source, the more it's likely to be well adapted to your conditions. And for me, they're little reminders of, oh, I collected that from the lane up the road or I collected that from... Uh, the local wood and now I have a bit of that growing and I have the chance that if it was growing locally it probably has the wildlife there that when that wildlife decides to go its travel with its suitcase it may chance upon my little bit of habitat and give it another stopping place. Yeah. Um, Sophie Mel says she didn't scarify when she created her meadow she just used plant plug plants. Mm. Um, do you have any advice for year two and more advice about plug planting? Plug planting is, is 
great, not quite as cheap as seeds, but a really good way of adding established plants into the turf. The risk is if you've still got quite a, a dense sward full of grasses, it's still possible for those plug plants to be quickly uh, overcrowded by the grasses. So as well as doing the plug plants, uh, you may well have put some plugs of yellow rattle in there. But if you think that yellow rattle is, is in short supply or you haven't got any and you have got quite a density of grass in there, then I'd recommend this autumn doing a bit of, bit of scarifying around your plug plants, pop some yellow rattle seed in and keep that grass under control. But otherwise, for year two, uh, enjoy it. See what comes up. See how well it flowers. Again, just as with seed, don't expect everything that you plug plant to survive. It may do so for one year, two year, three year, and then disappear. And some may find the conditions absolutely to their liking and, and flourish. And go with the flow, see what works in, in your meadow. The aim I always think is not to create a beautiful wildflower meadow from the 16th century because it hasn't had a thousand years to get to that condition. Create what you can, enjoy what comes, increase the diversity wherever you can, um, but um, knowing that what you've created is gonna be far and away better than what it replaced. Brilliant. Would you recommend plug planting if you go down that route in the autumn or spring? Both are fine, absolutely fine. Um, uh, if you come into spring, then there is uh, a greater chance these days of dry spring periods and you'll probably need to keep them watered because it's possible for that, that plug to really shrink within its hole and therefore the roots aren't getting out into the soil around them. So spot watering of the plugs that you've done will help them establish. In autumn, it shouldn't be so much of a of an issue unless we get a, a bizarre uh, Indian summer. But yeah, either is fine. Okay, right. I, so our last question um, on dandelions again. Uh, Malcolm Wilkinson asks, why have the dandelions almost entirely gone from the meadow over 10 years of management? Hay rattle and many other flowers well established now. Yeah, okay, that is interesting. Um, so dandelions very typically are one of the few flowers that seem to be able to cope with the lushness of turf when it's been fertilized and it may well be that the decrease in fertility as you've taken away the the top growth year by year and it, it's so important to seek to decrease even though that old rule of you can only do meadows on low fertility soil I think we can put that to one side you can do you can do your pop-up meadow and it's going to be valuable on any soil but then when you take away the top growth every year that you cut you're removing nutrients the slide that I showed of Richard Brown doing his meadows uh, over near Spalding in Lincolnshire, he's done a, a meadow on really lush soil, taken the, the material away. And after 10 years, he is still getting um, lush growth, not as lush as it was, but it's giving evidence that to reduce the fertility can be 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 year job. But it's quite possible, Malcolm, that... Um, you've reduced the fertility enough that dandelions aren't sucking up the, those nutrition and creating those smothering rosettes of dandelion leaves, uh, the, the teeth of lion's leaves that um, is so good at smothering other plants. So um, I'd say that that's doing fine. There are going to be plenty of other dandelions around uh, and about, but that, that's what I would put it down to. But as I say, meadows evolve and some of it is probably a mystery. and I'm quite happy that it remains that way. Thank you. I think that's all we've got time for in terms of questions. Um, I'd just like to say that um, before we go is our next talk is a celebration of Wildflower Meadows with George Peterkin, author of Meadows, The Definitive Guide. Um, that's taking place in South Devon. So really it's for people who live in, in South Devon. But um, it's the 15th of April at 7.30. Um, details are on the More Meadows events page um, on our website. Uh, that talk will also be recorded and will be uploaded to our More Meadows YouTube channel. Um, finally, to say we have an online community forum it's called the Meadow Makers Network. It's free to join and it's for everyone who's interested in making meadows. You know, that's whatever the scale. So it's mini meadows or landscape scale. And um, so please check that out on the forum.meadowmakersnetwork.org.uk. 
Um, and just want to say thank you, Adrian. That was a fantastic talk. Some really good questions from the audience and some brilliant answers. Um, thank you for joining us. And just like to say thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight and to Steve, who's um, behind the scenes. So hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.